welcome to Health Hope. My name is Joan Warner and I'm your host. Today's special guest is Carl Archibald. Carl survived blood clots and is here to tell us about it. Welcome, Carl. Welcome, Ms. Jones. Glad to be here. So take us back to when you had this injury. What exactly occurred? Well, I end up um, walking down the street across from where I used to live. And I fell into a hole which was in the ground covered with grass. Okay, so the grass had grown over the hole. Yes, ma'am. So you couldn't see the hole at all. No, ma'am. And then when you fell in, it was pretty deep, right? Yes, it was. And then what happened? Um, as I was walking, I ended up getting a Charlie horse into my calf. I ended up jerking my leg out of the hole and jerking blood clots into my legs. So you're, you're in severe pain then? Yes, I was. I mean, like on a scale of ten, 1 to 10, it was like a... Uh, it was like a 10. It was like a, like a 110. 110, <laughs> yes. Okay. And um, what did you do then? Did you go to the doctor? Did you go to the hospital? Did you go home? Not right away. I was shocked there for a minute, for about 30 minutes. I really, so you were in shock? Yes. Were you, were you dizzy? Or? I was dizzy. I was very dizzy, and I couldn't move for them, and it was excruciating pain. Oh, wow. And then uh, eventually you got home? Eventually I got home, and my leg was still paining. I felt like I thought nothing of it. I was hopping a little bit, but didn't think no more of it. Maybe it would be okay. And as time went on, my leg began to pain more. And uh, I would turn out to be, to still try to walk around on it and hoping that it would be okay. But it didn't get any better? It didn't get any better. It just gotten worse. So um, I finally decided I would go to the doctor, see about it. So when I did go to the doctor, they told me I had blood clots in my legs. Oh. Yes, and um, the doctor uh, said that he could do surgery on my leg right away. I went to go to Vanderbilt, and it was just too high for me for the insurance to pay for it. So he told me that he could go to Baptist, and it would be a lot cheaper for my insurance to have the surgery. So I didn't only just check there, I also went to uh, General Hospital. Okay. So as I went to General Hospital, it was a little bit more cheaper. <laughs> so it was less expensive. Less so. expensive. <laughs> There's a benefit. There is a benefit. And did you decide to have it done right away or did you wait? I waited because I was a little shocked of uh, having the surgery. A little, oh, you were scared. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody likes to be cut. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, as time went. Um, so you waited. Did, did you wait a year? Did you wait a month? Or? I waited, I think it was a little bit over a year. You waited a year. I waited a year. And I was trying as uh, I would ride a bicycle to ease the pain out to stretch the ligaments in the leg and hoping that it would be all right. What was it? Did that help? Well, it didn't totally help, but it helped for a little while. But it still did not stop the pain. It just made it tolerable. It just made it more tolerable. And you just kept hoping it'd get better. And I kept time. hoping it'd get better <laughs> yeah. that I wouldn't have to go through the surgery. Yeah. So you uh, waited five years because cause you just couldn't walk any more on it. You were, I, I couldn't take no more pain. Uh, it took me at least three hours of surgery before I came out of it. When I come from surgery, uh, I did not see my doctor anywhere, nobody to talk to. I don't know where he was or why he didn't come. It took to a little bit too long to get right, to you. Right, right. So you became concerned? I became concerned about it. Mm -hmm. And then he finally came? And then he finally came, and he told me it would at least take three to four months before my leg would get even stronger, even better. And. Um, well, what else did he tell you? Did he tell you uh, during the surgery? He told me that he would make sure that all the clots would be taken care of. Okay, so the surgery was to take out all the blood clots. Right, right. And uh, did that happen? He did not. He missed a blood clot. The blood clot that he ended up missing ended up 
causing me a lot of more pain still in my leg as I was okay. starting to get better. And I wanted to know why the pain was still there. Well, then you must have been really concerned that he had missed a blood clot or two, right? I and was so, very concerned. So you became so concerned you decided to, to do what? I decided to go back to the doctor and discuss this with him. And he told me that it would be a little more while long to let this leg heal and to keep walking on it and to exercise that the clots that he let left into my leg that he did not get would break up and eventually will dissolve. Okay, but you weren't, you weren't happy with that? No, no, I wasn't happy with that at all. So what did you do? Um, I relied on the medicine that he gave me for the blood clots. So the, that medicine was what? Uh, it was, uh, was it warfarin. Like, warfarin, which is what? A blood thinner. All right. So you took the medicine, but did you decide that uh, maybe you were going to get a second opinion? Well, I just kind of went with the flow of that and just had God hope and trust that he was, he was knowing what he was talking about when he was telling me this. But you didn't wait too long. You, I, I, you, you <laughs> wait like what, under 48 hours, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I kept going back, getting my leg tested. Um, but you went, but you got a second opinion, I correct? did get a second and, opinion. And, and uh, what did they tell you during, the, uh, during that exam? Well, he told me that I had a blood clot that would move up to my lungs that the first surgery did not get all of the blood clot. And this is the reason why the blood clot traveled up my legs and went to my lungs. So, so all of a sudden now, it's gone from your calf right. into your lungs. Right. And that pain had to have been infinitely worse than the pain in the leg. Very, very painful. Yeah. Um, I, did, uh, you, did you think you were going to make it? I wasn't sure that I was going to make it because I thought I had pneumonia. And come find out, it was the blood clots that had moved up. All right, so, so you felt like it was pneumonia. You thought it was pneumonia because it, of the chest pain. Yes. And then they found out it was actually a blood, blood clot. Blood clot, two of them. Not one but two. Not one but two. And uh, what did they decide that they would do at that well, point? Well, they said I had fluid on my chest and they would drain it with tubes. And where did the fluid come from? The, the fluid came from, I guess, uh, I guess the fluid that developed from around my heart, my chest, and me drinking the water. Um, wait, wait. Uh, let's go back. He put you on um, blood thinners, right? Right. So did that have something to do with the, the blood, the fluid on your chest? Well, I had some blood in it and, and fluid as well as water. Okay, I see, I see. Right. All right, so they had to drain it. Yeah. So did that mean you had to do another surgery? Uh, no, it just means that they had to be drained out and... Uh, they had to put drains in you, right? Right. Tubes in me to drain put from the tubes in you, yes. okay. And with about a week or two, they would pull them out because I had no more drains in my lungs. But it was very painful when they pulled them out so you went two weeks with the drains in, and it's it's draining the fluid and the extra blood from the blood thinners out. Yes. And were you feel, were you feeling better at this point? I did feel a sign of relief. Okay. Yes, but I was very sore, yeah. <laughs> very sore, and there was lots of pain. And uh, they came and took X-rays every day of my lung. All right, but then all of a sudden the pain started to increase again, correct? The pain did increase again. All right. And. Uh, you had to get another I exam. I had to get another exam. An x-ray. An x-ray. And they did scrape my lungs. They scraped your lungs. They scraped my lungs, which made it more painful and sore. And then I ended up having to put a umbrella stent into my stomach to keep me from having blood clots going to my heart. Well, that was a good thing then, right? It was a I good mean, thing. I mean, that was worth the surgery. That yeah. was worth the second opinion. It, it was worth the second opinion. and. Without God, I don't know what I would have done without him. Right. I think you probably had a few people praying for you, too. I huh? did have a lots of people praying for me, and I could feel the prayers coming to me, and I could feel the warmness, and I could feel God entering into me and giving me a second chance to live again. At one point, uh, didn't you uh, maybe pull out an IV by accident? I did. One time I did. Uh, the IV wasn't stuck in well, and I was uh, laying down, 
And as I moved my hand, I had an IV stuck in my hand, and it came out. And blood was just going everywhere. Because of the blood, the blood thinners? That's the blood thinners. And uh, they had a nurse come in. I had a nurse come in, was screaming and hollering and panicking. And uh, I wouldn't panic at all. I mean, I mean, I'm saying it's just blood. I mean, you can come in and stop this and help me. Mm -hmm. So the doctor finally came in. They put a bandage over and they held it to it, slowed down, and then they restuck it. And then they got me going back again, the blood flowing back where it's supposed to. And that nurse, she came back and visited you, didn't she? She came back <laughs> and she visited me again. Mm -hmm. What'd she say? And she said, I'm so glad you are all right. She said, because I didn't know what to do. She said, and I'm, you know, she was just furious scared. I said, you didn't have to be scared. God's got me. Mm -hmm. We're good. I said, but thank you for being concerned. Well, she was afraid that, that you were gone, yeah. She was. She, she, she ran and got help yeah, right away, yeah. right? Yeah, she, she and, thought I was just leaving this earth right yeah. away. But God, it wasn't my time. He wasn't ready for me. He had another plan for she me. She kept checking on you too, didn't she? She did, she did. She kept coming back at least every 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so you get a second chance. And, uh, um, why do you think you get a second chance in life? Why do you think God gave you a second chance? Well, I think I have a job to do for him. I think it's time for me to serve God. I've served myself, I've served other people, but it's time for me to serve God and God have some work for me to do. Yeah. Yes. So. Would you say that perhaps this might be a blessing in disguise of some sorts? It is a blessing because I thought I was gone and just to be able to feel, to be able to live again and know that I was going to live, my life changed. It made me a better person, made me a stronger person, and it opened my eyes up. Thanks to God. God's good, isn't he? Yes, he is. God's very good. So, Carl, if you're going to give our audience any advice, what would that advice be? Always keep God into your life and always trust in God and God will take care of you and take care of all your needs. That's what I would give the audience. Always have God in your heart and believe in Him. And if you were going to tell them any warning signals, any warning signs of uh, when it's time to go to the emergency room for possible blood clots, what would that be? You could always check with more than one doctor for more opinions than one. If you feel that you're uncomfortable with that, I would advise you to check with more than one doctor. And uh, what kind of what kind of pain uh, sensations would you would you describe? How, how would you know that that this is serious? That it could be a possible blood clot. Well, you get tightening of your chest. You get hard of breathing. You get short breath. And it's just excruciating pain at a 10 level. And this is how you know that you're having chest pains or problems or something that's going on that's not right with your lung. Well, Carl, I thank you so much for coming out and being on our show and educating our public. And um, I hope you come back again. Thank you. And I'm glad to be here. And thank you for inviting me here. And God bless us all. And thank you all for everything. The Lord, my prayers, and has been answered. Thank you. Well, thank you for tuning in to Health Hope. For more information, contact us at www.health-hope.org. Hi, I'm Gail McKenzie, and this is Got a Minute in the Word. You know, there's a lot being said today about being a disciple of Christ. And sometimes that's a little bit misunderstood or maybe not understood at all. It's just something we throw out there. Yeah, I'm a disciple of Jesus or yeah, I believe in Jesus. But Jesus was very clear in one of my favorite passages and one of my favorite stories. And we're going to go to the book of Luke. That's one of the gospels in the New Testament. And Luke was a doctor who liked to write down a lot of details about what happened with Jesus and what he said. This story is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In fact, he was baptized, went into the wilderness, was tempted by Satan, came out victorious, and actually read his mission statement in Luke 4 to people who were all around him, Pharisees, rulers, scribes. And then he went on and 
people became a little confused about who this man was. They were wondering, what is he doing? He even healed somebody, and he ends up here in Luke 4, verse 38. It says, Jesus left the synagogue, and he went to the home of Simon. Now, Simon, he didn't really know him real well, but it sounds like maybe Simon knew him because he asked him to come to his home. It says, now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. Wow, that was amazing, wasn't it? And then it goes on. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness. And laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. So something's going on. There's a stir amongst the people in Galilee and Jerusalem and all of that surrounding area. And here is Jesus now. It says, At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place, a place by himself, but the people were looking for him. Why? Because there had been healing going on. They wanted to know who this man was. And so they tried to keep him from leaving them because he was going to take off. Verse 43. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. I want you to note something. He didn't say, well, I think I might go preach to somebody else. I think maybe I have to tell somebody, I might, if it's convenient, or if I feel like it, or if I'm in the mood, I think I'll go. What's the word he used? He said, I must. Now, that's a pretty strong word, isn't it? When your mother told you sometime, you must clean your room, that was like, you got to do it. There's not any option there. So Jesus says, I must do what? Preach the good news. And so now we go into this wonderful story because just a little while after that, it says one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he's preaching to them from the word, the very word of God. And he's at the lake, the Sea of Galilee actually is what it is. And it says that the people are crowding around him. In fact, what it means, they are pressing him they're pressing him into the lake. He doesn't have any room. He's at the very edge. And this is what he says. It says, Luke says, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Now, we got to understand something. When you're washing something, when fishermen are washing, what does that mean? That means they're probably done. And I want you to think about those nets and how they catch everything in the sea. I mean, little pieces of all kinds of green stuff coming out of the sea and, and everything else. And so, I mean, it's just full of all this gunk. That's what I'll call it, gunk. And they have to clean it all out. It's going to take them a while. They're done. They are finished. It's kind of like, I think of it like this for women specifically, or me, hey, men too. When you've had a big group and you are doing a lot of things in your house and you've got a lot of people that you've fed and your kitchen is a mess, what do you do? You clean it all up, and when you are done, what are, you are done, and you are glad you're done. You don't want to mess it up again, but look what happens here. It says that he saw two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. This is Jesus. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. The boat becomes his pulpit and he's teaching the people. Now look what happens next. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now you have to understand, Simon Peter, he's the fisherman. He knows when it's possible and when it's the best time to fish, and it's at night, and they have fished all night long. Listen to what Peter says. Simon said, answered, Master, we worked hard all night. And that word actually, by the way, means we are exhausted. We can't do another thing. And so here he goes. He says, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. Can you imagine? Not even one little tiny minnow. Not an itsy bitsy nothing. Absolutely nothing. 
how discouraging that had to be all night long in the best time ever to catch fish. And now Jesus has put that boat out into a little ways into the water. And so he goes a little ways. You see, Jesus pushes him to go out a little first, just a little, and then see what happens here. And now Simon Peter continues, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. That's what Peter said. And when they had done so, you see, they followed, they did what Jesus said. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Jesus first said, go out a little ways and I'm going to preach. But then he says, now you got to go out into the deep. You got to trust me. You got to listen to what I'm saying. I can do the impossible. I want you to follow me, follow my lead, listen to my voice. Listen to what I'm saying. And I love Peter's answer. And I actually like the acronym, B-Y-S-S-I-W. You're gonna say, what is that? B-Y-S-S-I-W. I'm reading from the NIV. And again, this is what Peter says. Because you say so, I will. Because you say so, I will. And what happened? What happened when he did that? Boat loads of fish. So many fish, in fact, let's finish this story. When they had done so, they listened, they obeyed, and they followed Jesus. They caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boats, come on, we need help. And they said, come on, help us. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. They had hit the lottery. I mean, fish like you've never seen in the worst part of the day against everything that they knew as fishermen. And here they had boatloads of fish. What an amazing story. And this is what Jesus finishes with there. First of all, we see Simon Peter and it says he saw this. This is verse eight. He fell at Jesus' knees and he said, go away from me. Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, all his partners, all of Simon's business partners there. And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. This is what he said. From now on, you will catch men. You're going to be fishers of men. And it says immediately, immediately. They didn't question. They didn't say, oh, well, I got that boatload of fish. Oh, I don't know. You know, I like that. Oh, I think I'm going to stay maybe and take care of this fish. They didn't do that. Immediately, they followed him. No questions asked. It didn't matter because they saw in Jesus something that they knew they wanted and they obeyed him. Because you say so, I will. I love that. You know, there's a story of a young girl who wanted to follow Jesus. She wanted to do everything that he said. She was praying and she's praying and she had this impression that she was to go down to the local grocery store and stand on her head in front of the drink machine and she thought no no I can't do that but you know what over and over she kept getting that impression and she just had to do it because that's what she was knew that God wanted her to do and she went down there she went on her head she put those legs up in the air and she sees these boots in front of her and she realizes this is a police officer and she doesn't know what to do. She jumps up and I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And he says, it's okay, it's okay. And he starts to cry. And she says, what did I do? I'm so sorry. And he said, I can't believe that you are doing this here and now. The rest of the story is this man was going through a divorce and he was so discouraged and so depressed that he was going to take his life, this policeman was, and he was so angry at God that he just looked up and he shouted, God, I don't believe you're there, but if you're there, then you make the girl, when I walk in this convenience store, you have a girl standing on her head in front of a drink machine. That's how he cried out to God. And here was this girl who listened to the voice of God, something kind of crazy actually, but innocent in the fact that she got down on her head and, and stood up on her head, I should say, and put her legs into the air because God knew that this man needed to see that he was real. 
And this man turned his life around because of that young girl listening to the voice of God. I hope that you're listening today to God. I hope that you're a follower of Jesus. I hope that even if he asks you to do the impossible, you know that he is all powerful and that he will do what he says. He can give you a boatload of fish, but then he may ask us to walk away from it. To give our all, immediately they walked away and they followed Jesus. Because you say so, I will. That's what I want to say to Jesus today. How about you? This has been Got a Minute in the Word. Stress Relief. With as many as 90% of doctor visits due to stress-related illnesses, it's vital that you take steps to reduce the amount of stress in your life. To improve your health and simply have some fun, consider taking up one of the following hobbies. Try gardening. You get to enjoy being outdoors in the fresh air and sunshine, which can lift your spirits as well as the opportunity for light physical exercise. And seeing something that you've planted grow into beautiful plants can be quite rewarding. How about playing a musical instrument? Poet Berthold Auberk once said, Music washes away from the soul the dust of everyday life. Playing a musical instrument can soothe you and at the same time occupy your mind so you aren't focused on your concerns. I know for a fact my husband's grandmother played the piano almost until the day she died which was at the age of 105. If you can't play an instrument, then how about trying amateur photography? Capturing special moments with family and loved ones, taking a quiet walk to photograph a sunset can be an enjoyable way to relax. As an added benefit, you will have beautiful photos to remind you of the pleasant memories that you've captured on camera. With today's technology, it can be a simple and easy way to enjoy life. One stress reducer is to try creative writing or crossword puzzles. Brain teasers you can easily find on the computer. These can be easy ways to pass time and exercise your cognitive functions, keeping your brain youthful and healthy. This has been a health moment.